Number 10, The Red Bee. We're going to be talking about the first Red Bee, who debuted in Hit Comics number 1 back in 1940. Also, his power is more of an attribute, but we'll get to that. He was originally a quality comics creation, but was bought along with all their other assets by DC once their company folded. The first Red Bee was Rick Raleigh, who was a district attorney by day and crime fighter by night, and also sometimes by day. So he fought crime in his red and yellow striped costume with the help of his trained bees and stinger gun. Trained bees. Now this, okay, this could sound terrifying. You're just about to steal a painting, suddenly bees. But if you take a moment to calm down, fight the ears to scream, not the bees. There are lots of ways to get around bees. Just be prepared. Pun not intended, but appreciated. Bug spray, also it was still the golden age, so giant net. There are just more useful powers out there. I mostly want to talk about this because I want to make bad bee jokes. The bees can sense royalty and superheroes apparently. He kind of just faded, but there was a new Red Bee on the scene for a while, his grandniece Jenna. She had a mech suit and mechanical bees. So better, improving the family rep. However, she eventually gave up her superhero life in the name of research. It's okay. We'll always have the trained bees. Number nine, Six Pack. Okay, so Six Pack doesn't really have any powers. Maybe? He just thinks he does because, well, he's really drunk all the time. He first appeared in Hitman number no. 9 back in 1996. Hitman followed the adventures of Tommy Monahan and his contract killing exploits, which somehow found themselves set in the DC universe despite its odd tone as a comic. Six Pack was a member of Section 8. In fact, he formed the team. They go around aiding Tommy Monahan, or do they? Aiding. Six Pack's main power appears to be his extremely high tolerance for alcohol, and while drunk, he'll tell anyone and everyone who'll listen about his heroic exploits. However, when he sobers up, he's not sure any of it happened. However, he may also have reality altering powers, but if he does have them, he doesn't remember that when he's sober. So, yeah, not the best. His liver will thank him for not living a superhero life, but will the world? Probably, actually. Hitman was an interesting one. Number eight, Armfall Off Boy. It wouldn't be one of these lists without Armfall Off Boy. He debuted in Secret Origins Volume 2, number 46, back in 1989. Yeah, he's a lot more recent than most people think. So he can detach his own limbs, but usually does it with his arms, because, well, that's the most convenient. Very few situations where you can detach a leg and wield it properly without falling over. Although if you could, you'd have a much stronger weapon. So he can beat people with his arms or teach them the importance of leaving a note. Little Arrested Development reference for y'all. So Armful Off Boy's real name is Floyd Belkin, and well, he can beat people with his arms as if they're clubs. And apparently he got his powers by accident, while holding an anti-gravity metal element 152. However, it's Matter Eater Lad who said that, so take it with a grain of salt. In his first appearance, Armful Off Boy was rejected from the Legion of Superheroes. This was during their tryouts, and it was for having powers that were not useful enough. He then tried again, but when he made it to the final five, he literally fell to pieces, just limbs everywhere. So yeah, Armful Off Boy, he sure exists. Number seven, Telepathic Resistance. The weird thing about this power is that it never seems to be fully explained. Some mutants train to get this and others just seem to possess a natural resistance to telepathy. Beast appears to fall more into the second category, cause you know, you can't be an X-Men unless you have some level of telepathic resistance. However, Beast's resistance to telepathy is kind of dumb because, well, he's not that great at it. It basically just means he is not openly vulnerable to telepathic influence. But when up against a powerful or potent telepath, or if someone can use his fears, like Cassandra Nova did against Beast, his resistance quickly breaks down. So this power is kind of a dumb one because it's just, well, it's not that useful. And after all, the X Men are more often dealing with powerful telepaths than low level ones, so. Number six. Giant hands and feet. Originally, Beast started out as a normal ish looking man, simply having large hands and feet, which he was ridiculed for in school, so I guess. It's not completely normal. Visibly, this appeared to be the only super thing about him. Granted, he was also super strong, super agile, and speedy at the time as well. He also had that advanced intellect that we love. But while looking mostly normal, this weird feature that seemed to come along with his mutation and powers was an odd one. Namely, because other mutants with similar enhancements to speed and strength and agility don't really seem to share it. They don't really have, like, large hands or large feet. I know not all mutants are the same, trust me, do I know that, but still, it was a weird trait to give Beast, especially when you would expect someone with large hands and feet to be, you know, more clumsy than dexterous. 
Yet Marvel decided to go the opposite way with it. Number 5 Doesn't Need to Sleep Apparently, having his form change from ape like to more feline like not only stole a digit from Beast's hands, but also changed his sleeping patterns. He mentions this during Astonishing X Men Volume 1, Issue 25. The issue starts off with Beast singing, and we follow him until he runs into Xavier Institute student Armor, aka Hisako Ochiki. She reminds him of her threat to shave Japanese obscenities into his fur while he sleeps if she caught him singing again. Which obviously she has. Hank answers the threat by sharing with Hisako that he no longer really needs more than two hours of sleep a night. What? This might be a useful one for being pulled into a fight in the middle of the night or needing to keep watch, but it also just seems like such a random superpower to have as a byproduct of an outward change of physical appearance. Yeah, that's right. Beast micro naps apparently. He's got some like he's got some small sleeping skills. Strange. Especially considering many cats that I've interacted with seem to be pretty sleepy creatures, so this doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Number 4 Minor Pheromone Manipulation Sometimes heroes have powers that we really get to see in action, and these are the powers that always blow me away. For Hank, one such power is his ability to secrete pheromones which make members of the opposite sex become attracted to him. While it has been mentioned in a copy of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe X-Men edition from 2004, we have yet to see Hank really utilize it. He has had a fairly active love life, and Abigail Brand, who has been a long time love of his, has even expressed an interest in starting a family. But it's more likely that it is simply Simply Beast's personality and soft blue fur that have caused women to just fall for him, not his use of pheromone power. Unless there's something we don't know, and Beast is maybe just like a master manipulator. He's just secreting pheromones all the time, and that's why it all happens. Oh my goodness. I'm not ready for that revelation. It'd be weird. Number three, secondary mutation. This is apparently the power and ability that we have to blame, which has caused Hank so many changes over the years. He developed a secondary mutation as a result of consuming his serum, which he sought to protect from being stolen, and this caused him to mutate more and caused him to enhance his mutation permanently. Long term, it is suspected that this has continued to affect the evolution of his mutation, causing him actually to also. Also continued to change and awakening within Hank recessive genes in his DNA, which have caused him to revert to a more animal like appearance. He's like a two way evolution, embodying the strengths of those we evolved from and the advancements of the modern man, shown by his advanced intellect. This becomes, in and of itself, a little bit silly, though, when you realize that it means he went from ape to cat because of this. So I guess who knows where to next? Because I would think, you know, maybe cat, then ape. Ape is like all the way at the back, right? I don't know. Someone that studied evolution, in, like, let us know in the comments. <laughs> Number two, claws and fangs. This addition to Beast's physique definitely makes sense as it came with the change of his appearance into a more beast like and ape like state. But it's still, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous, mostly because Beast doesn't really use either of these things. The juxtaposition of his calm and curious nature with his beast like physique and features makes a lot of Beast related powers and assets feel kind of misplaced, or I guess just wasted, because he doesn't really like to connect with them or utilize them that much. The same can be said about his long claws and features, which typically end up as just ornamental and used by writers to make Beast feel like even more of an outcast than he already does. Which is sad. I want him to just be feel good about his appearance. I guess sometimes he does, but sometimes he doesn't. And he wants to like cure himself, and I'm like, no, ah, I'm conflicted. Number one, animal instinct. Hank might view this trait as a weakness, oddly enough, but I would argue that it's not a weakness because it makes him stronger. It makes him do things he would not normally think to do. It makes him hesitate less. He would likely be able to apprehend more villains than not, catching them off guard with his sheer strength and speed and focus. I mean, he also might kill them, but. They'd be stopped at least. But Hank fears his animal side, which alienates him from it and causes any instincts he taps into to be rebuked as opposed to embraced. Really, I think he just needs to take a page out of Wolverine's book, tap into his instincts, and let go a little bit more. Facing his fears would only make him stronger, I think, and eventually give him more control over a power that could be better utilized. Number 10 Temperature Resistance. The crazy thing about this power isn't so much that it exists, but that it appears to have always existed. Even before Beast had his iconic fur, he was resistant to cold. A fur coat makes sense for this, but his randomly being cold resistant doesn't 
really make a ton of sense without it. Although this is also back when beasts had an insane healing factor and could heal from almost any injury, similar to Wolverine or Deadpool. A temperature resistance makes sense for a furry character who would be insulated, or even a character who I guess is known for their endurance. However, the weird carryover of this power as Beast has changed over the time, from having a healing factor to a blue fur coat, is just kind of strange. Number 9. Magic in the 2016 series of all new X-Men, we see Hank turn from scientific pursuits to those of a more magical variety. What makes this fairly silly is his sort of resentment and disbelief surrounding magic as he specifically attempts to use magic himself. It was a weird exploration of his character when writers decided to incorporate a bit of magic into his world, as Hank has always been known as a man of books and maybe a fantasy in a more romantic or literary sense, but certainly not in a magical superpower sense. So. Number 8. Handy Feet One of the powers that I have always found to be both silly and useful is Beast's enhanced dexterity. He can use this skill in combat to turn himself into a skilled acrobat, dodging blows, stealthily leaping across rooms, gracefully landing where he is needed, and helping in the fray to defeat the enemy. But he can also use this skill to perform mental tasks with his feet. Why? Well, usually because he's busy reading. He's used his feet to type, pour liquids out of beakers, and even once used them alone to fight as he was trying to read during the instigation. How one could truly focus on both I can't even comprehend. I guess because of his enhanced intellect? Or maybe he was just like me when I try to multitask while reading and he's just like stuck reading the same sentence over and over and over without it sinking in. But maybe he just didn't want to admit that. So it looks like he's reading, but really he's just reading the same sentence. Number 7. Color Manipulation so when we're talking about this, we're talking mostly about the color kid, who can change the color of any object at will. Now, cool for your career as an interior decorator extraordinaire, but for your crime fighting career, less so. So this character once used this to mask a MacGuffin so that the villain couldn't find it. But I mean, this is a stopgap measure. He also tripped someone, cause he blended an object into the floor. So distraction at best, annoyance at worst. Now you could work this, but you'd have to be one think on your toes color manipulator. So many other careers. Children's entertainer, that would be another good one. Teach the young ones all about mixing colors. Number 6. Omniscience So omniscience sounds great, you know everything, but it tends to freeze a person in place a bit, enraptured by all the knowledge they have, especially if they have a certain chair. To quote Batman, I am never getting out of this chair. Three Jokers, Joe Chill, sitting next to Green Lantern on a couch construct. Hal having to give Bruce his ring to will himself out of the knowledge chair is still one of the most hilarious things ever. Also, you can kind of plan for everything if you know everything, so it also gets a bit less interesting on that front narratively as well. This is why, with rare exceptions, this tends to be a fleeting ability, and then the hero is left trying to grasp at all the straws of the knowledge they once had. Also, it tends to be shown as pushing the heroes away from their heroic natures, for knowledge is power and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Number 5. Organ Rearrangement Now this is great in battle. Someone's going in for a kill shot, just relocate your heart or whatever needs to be relocated because you know, they're coming at you. But the question is, how quickly does this happen? Is this organ teleportation or more like the slow, progressive slog of it through your body? Can you feel it? That'd be really gross if you could. However, when else do you need this? I mean, aside from pranking purposes, terrify your friends and family. Where is your heart? How are you alive? Surprise, ma, I'm a mutant. The thing for characters who have this ability is it usually isn't brought up until absolutely necessary, so you can get a bit of deus ex organ rearrangement. Number 4. Charisma But charisma is not a power, you say. Some people are just charming. But in the comic book world, some people are more than charming. They may have magnetic personalities or other abilities that make them appealing to others, sometimes pheromones. The thing with this ability is it puts you in a position where you have to question their interactions, like do these people like them because they're nice? Or is it because there's some sort of influence going on? It veers pretty far into the realm of manipulation if used that way, and far away from heroic territory. And then you end up with Star Fox. Never go full Star Fox. Because essentially, then you've just gone purple man. Just let people have baseline charisma, that's fine. Average charm can feel like a superpower anyway. Number 3. Power Rings Now the power ring is a fantastic weapon, and one that is immensely powerful. I mean, with it the limits are literally only one's imagination. However, sometimes the constructs can get a little silly. People creating whole trains and cars around themselves and the like, 
Plus, without the rings, not all the lanterns have backups, not even some extra martial arts training. Simon Baz carried a gun for a bit, but that didn't go over well. Also, a couple of issues into having it, he shot and killed Sinestro. Thankfully, they were already in the realm of the undead, so it didn't have a permanent effect. But still, he would eventually be convinced he didn't need it. Kyle has some crazy constructs, because he's an artist. So the idea is that he would naturally have these really intricate designs because of his artistic nature. Okay, tell me that during a hostage situation under hostile fire. Really cool weapons, not always used to the best of their abilities. Number two, Eye Boy. So Eye Boy is covered in eyes, eyes everywhere. You can see everything from all directions. So one would assume your brain would also be honed to accommodate this newfound skill. But also, you'd be so vulnerable, all over, so many places for people to poke. And they don't even have to come for you. You could just fall over, smooshed. This, however, is a huge surveillance advantage, but you have to make sure your eye person doesn't get rushed into combat, or it could go very poorly, very quickly. Now for Eye Boy, they amped up these powers, gave the poor kid a break, and he can see more than just the average human with all of these eyes. He can see things like magic and people's personalities, so it's like an extra perception on top of just having more eyes. Or tracking, just a whole host of things. Make up for what would otherwise be just being ten eyed man but all over your body. And number one, niceness vibes. Feel the vibe, man. This was an ability particularly highlighted by the third gold star, who just wanted the universe to be a kind and decent place, which made him the arch enemy of Lobo, and the two would regularly get into dust ups. Goldstar was even drawn to be the opposite of Lobo. He can encourage people to be nice, because he emits niceness vibes, but they most certainly do not work on the main man. Goldstar would routinely get his butt handed to him, because the writers did not like him, and were just waiting for the day that he would kind of fade into obscurity. Which isn't very nice. See, his vibes don't work at all. Number 10, Maggots! This approach is just plain weird and dumb, in the sense that it doesn't really even make sense. Maggot is a mutant, and one of his abilities involves, you guessed it, maggots. Two, to be exact. The maggots are named Eeny and Meeny. And what power do they give this once X Men? Well, they are basically Maggot, aka Japeth's digestive system. He discovered them with Magneto's help after originally thinking he had stomach cancer and was about to die. The maggots have to burrow in and out of his stomach every time they feed, which is depicted as being very painful and harrowing for Japeth. The plus side? He gets nourishment from what they eat, which makes him powerful? Like what? How does one even come up with an idea like this? Number 9. Shocker, also known as Herman Schultz. Shocker's power was one that was actually engineered by him, as Schultz is known for being a brilliant engineer. So less super, more self-made, but still fully ridiculous in premise. Shocker's ability is that he vibrates. Yep, Schultz, depending on the version, creates a glove or a suit, which allows him to produce intense blasts of vibrated airwaves. His powers actually can be quite useful, allowing him to pack a more powerful punch and vibrate out of his foe's grasp. And at one point, he actually did have vibration as an actual superpower. And the idea behind this one is just hilarious. Number eight, made of insects. While there are many super strong and useful heroes that are influenced by insect and insect-like abilities, some characters in the Marvelverse take Take this too far, to the point where it appears to become uh, less useful. Namely those heroes and villains who are simply made up of insects. Swarm is one such villain who used to be Fritz von Mayer, a Nazi scientist who after experimenting on bees was torn apart by them, but not before they absorbed his consciousness. Yep. So now he's a dude who can be defeated by bug repellent. Like what I did there? Likewise, there is an alternate version of Spider Man called Spider's Man, whose only seeming abilities are that he looks like Spider Man, has Peter Parker's consciousness, but is really just a bunch of experimented on spiders in a human shape. Surprisingly, Spider's Man at least seems to be able to fight quite well. And he's certainly really creepy. Number seven, Doll Man. Once more, we must head back to the Golden Age, and we're gonna talk about the first Doll Man. There have been three. We're talking about Dare. Daryl Dane, who debuted in Feature Comics number 27 back in 1939, and he was labeled the Earth's Mightiest Might, and may have been the first shrinking hero. He could shrink down to 6 inches, so doll size. So you may be wondering, why is he here? Shrinking is a good power. However, unlike
unlike other shrinkers, he couldn't go in between sizes. No, full size or six inches, nothing else. People were confused by this initially though, because his size varied all the time in the comics, but that was an artist thing and not a story thing. But here's the real kicker. He's also proportionally the same strength as size, so he's as strong as a six inch doll man would be. So in short, not very. It's just not the best. I mean, good for infiltrating, but in a conflict, doll man is probably going down. There have been two more doll men since. DC's attempts to relaunch the character after enfolding him to the DC universe upon another Earth yielded middling results. And each one of these also doesn't have very credible shrinking power. It's okay. Doll man sounds more like a villain name anyway. Number six, Stone Boy. Stone Boy is one of those characters who is more credible now than when he first debuted. He first appeared in Adventure Comics number 306 back in 1963. He's a member of the Legion and comes from the planet Zwen. On this planet, the people could petrify their skin, and they used to hibernate for six months at a time, something that would also happen while Stoneboy was on Earth. And during that time, he would just be standing there, petrified. So his teammates would sometimes just pick him up and throw him at enemies. <laughs> just because you're hibernating doesn't mean you don't have to pull your weight. There is no hibernating team. In fact, because of this, he actually didn't make the team proper. He's a substitute on the Legion of Substitute Heroes. Just that name. Can you imagine people? People seeing you coming and being like, oh look, the Legion of Substitutes. Later, he gained the ability to move in stone form, so he's much more of a threat now, but he's still not used that much. And I hope that they still throw him. That's just amazing. Form of a giant paperweight. Number five. Brother, Power the Geek. He first debuted in Brother, Power the Geek number one back in 1968. So Brother the Geek was meant to be a take on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. He first appeared as an abandoned mannequin in a tailor shop. He was brought to life when he was struck by lightning. He was then captured by the circus who gave him a face. The book was actually this weird mix of both anti and pro hippie propaganda, with Brother the Geek running for Congress and encouraging the hippies to get real jobs. Here's the thing, the staff themselves didn't like this character and they wanted him gone. Although what's What's funny is that some people on staff felt that the hippies in the stories were too sympathetic, and also that the books featured way too much drug use. And some just wondered, why does this character exist? In later appearances, Brother Geek would be retconned to being an imperfect elemental, and he would take part in the Swamp Thing lore. He was then connected to all human simulacra, like dolls and statues, so much more useful and creepy. He can possess dolls now. That's terrifying. Number four, Color Kid. The fact that I know the lower third is not gonna have a U in it causes me physical pain. So this is another member from the League of Substitutes. Now, Color Kid has made few appearances and is set up as a happy-go-lucky classic sidekick type. His power, he can change the color of any object. There you go, phenomenal cosmic power. He once used his powers to conceal an object and trip some villains. Now, there are ways this power could be used, but it's really not all that useful comparatively. For every object you can cloak, you have a telekinetic or a force field user who can do the same thing. Still, you know what Color Kid would be great for? Parties. He has a great party career ahead of him. Superheroing isn't the only life choice out there for people with powers. Think about it. Number three, Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. Half man, half festival, half mineral. So this character isn't a hero. No, we have our first villain joining the list. He first debuted in Doom Patrol Volume 1, number 89, back in 1964. He's very metamorpho in terms of appearance. So he is Dr. Sven Larsen, who gained his powers after falling into a vat of amino acids. It was the 60s. We all know that falling into essentially a vitamin vat would not give you powers, sadly. So his powers are that he can change any part of his body into an animal, vegetable, or mineral. He can also combine them all at once into some horrible Franken compound. In classic appearances, usually only one side of his body would change and the other part would be kept normal, like one half of his face, so that he could be identified and had a base model for artists to be able to draw. He was briefly brought back in the New 52, but I think the world is safe from Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. Now that I've said that, watch him get his own miniseries, his own TV show. Number two, Rainbow Girl. It's time for more colors. She first debuted in Adventure Comics number 309 back in 1963 and is an alien from the planet Zolnar. Again, she's on the Legion of Substitute Heroes. Her power was wielding an emotion spectrum that resulted in her having intense, rather unpredictable mood swings. So how do her powers work? Well, she's not sure. She can tap into some of the colors, like red for anger, blue for hope, and green for willpower, so the land for an emotion spectrum, but that was introduced long after her creation. It is said that she mostly uses her powers, whatever they are, for fun. Also, guess what? She has pheromones, and she does abuse them. Oh yes, she does. She used them to create a rainbow aura around herself, giving her an irresistible personality to everyone. Just going full purple man, but without words. So do you like Rainbow Girl? You don't know. She may do. Also, why is she in the League, even the Substitute League? 
Mm -hmm. And finally, mm -hmm. in at number one, Friendly Fire. Friendly Fire had to be number one because his powers are hilarious. He's also a member of Section 8, and his powers are actually quite strong. Energy projection from his hands. He debuted in Hitman number 18 back in 1997. The only problem is he can't hit a target, and definitely not an enemy. In fact, he most often hits his allies, hence his name. It seems like he can only hit his allies. He's the guy you don't want in your team. He was so bad at using his powers, he actually killed himself with them, decapitating or rather disintegrating his own head. So the power is not dumb, but the fact that he used it while being so fundamentally unable to control it, yeah, that earns you a spot at number one. Number 10, Empathy. Empathic powers tend to flounder when they are on their own. Hence, in the superhero world, you will often find them paired with other abilities. For example, while empathy may be a large part of Raven's abilities, it is not the only part. She can also influence emotion, and also her soul self, and a whole host of demonic abilities. All of this is cause if you just have empathic abilities, you run into the Deanna Troy situation. I'm sensing hostility, Captain. Now, knowing someone's emotional state would be an asset, but without even telepathy to back it up, you'd still be kind of guessing, like, are they mad because of what happened in your battle or negotiation, or because the store ran out of hazelnut milk? You don't know. Also, you can't just yell it out. Hold up, Titans, he's sad. It's a very, I know something you don't know, maybe kind of power. However, as soon as you partner up with something else, it goes up a whole other level. Number nine, immortality. Now, being immortal doesn't always have the guarantee of coming with eternal youth, or lack of pain or disease, or even not being able to die. People just assume. But what if you're immortal and just becoming a prune? Or you get sick and then you're just sick forever, living as one massive tumor. Or you can still die painfully, but then get resurrected again. This one like before needs some kind of backup. Super strength, youth, Lazarus pits, anything. And you still need to contend with the existential dread of losing all those you care about and your connection to humanity. If you feel like you can't keep up with music after like a decade, imagine keeping up with people and trends after a century. Full time job. Could you stay good? Or do you think you'd get a little weird if you were immortal? Me, full Louis de Pointe de Lac, cabin full of books, life goals. Number eight, precognition. Now, precognition sounds like a great ability. You can see the future and then you can change it. But no, think about it. Either way, you've been Cassandra. So, you see the future and you change it. Well, that means the future is fluid. So, how good was your prediction in the first place? Did you change it? Would it always have changed? Or the other option, the future is inevitable. No matter what you do, you are hurtling towards that timeline. Heck, maybe even you trying to change it sets it on that path. Great, well what good is knowing then? It is more useful if you can change things, but then you have to live in a world of all these shifting potentialities. I guess it would also depend on how strong the ability was. Like, what if you were seeing things you couldn't exactly place, like somebody brushing their teeth, but evilly, but with no other clues. Then someone might try to steal you, and that might set off a Civil War II or a Minority Report. It's a whole thing. More trouble than it's worth. Number 7. Dazzler's Disco Ball Ability You could call Dazzler the bard of the Marvelverse. Alison Blair aka Dazzler is a mutant singer and disco queen who is able to convert sound to light, and sometimes energy. Though the power we will be focusing on in this list is her ability to convert sound into light. While she can also convert sound into energy to create photonic blasts or super focused light beams, i.e. lasers, one of her abilities is to just turn any sound into light. Though of course Dazzler prefers music. Making this power useless for fighting, but a pretty one for performing, and turning her into a sort of um, disco ball. Sometimes she uses this ability to try and distract enemies, which grants usually works, but it is also just strange and uh, hilarious. Number 6. Fireworks. Yeah, okay, so we're looking at you, Jubilee. Real talk, I actually love Jubilee and had a crush on the 90s animated series version of her, but still, fireworks? Really? While her powers are probably terrifying if you are epileptic, they are just otherwise mostly annoying if you are a villain. They're a really great party trick if you're a friend. I mean, imagine having fireworks at all your parties. That's a reality if you are friends with Jubilee. If you actually need to fight some sentinels though, this power is unfortunately not as useful. Also, Jubilee's firework power often just leads to her accidentally blowing things up. What's so wrong with being a mutant anyway? No, not again! Number 5. 
Kangaroo. Frank Oliver, aka Kangaroo, not only has a ridiculous power, but is also just a ridiculous character. He is a villain from Australia who studied kangaroos and eventually developed the superpower of jumping really, really high. You know, like a kangaroo, because he's Australian, get it? Yeah. Frank is also just a really unfortunate stereotype. Marvel writers, what are you doing? <laughs> Later, Kangaroo got his power leveled up when he was implanted with air jets, which also gave him super strong legs and even better jumping abilities. But the whole premise of this power is just ridiculous. Number four, Cypher. Another mutant making the list, Cypher, aka Douglas Ramsey, has what is probably considered one of the most useless powers in the history of mutants. He can translate any written or spoken languages. All in all, a pretty lame ability. Especially considering he is already a pretty intelligent person and anyone who is smart enough can learn pretty much any language. Not to mention, there's also the internet. So, Cypher was introduced in the 1980s, however, a time before Google Translate, Rosetta Stone, or Duolingo. And so, I kind of get where the writers may have been coming from. In the 80s, this idea was probably pretty fantastic. Not to mention, Cypher can also translate alien languages as well. Pretty fancy. However, despite all of these considerations, even in the 80s, this mutant's powers were considered a flop. Sorry, Cypher. Number three, the power of asbestos. Lady Asbestos is Victoria Murdoch, who was originally portrayed as being a brilliant scientist in the comics. Not brilliant enough, though, it seems. She was unsurprisingly first introduced in the 1940s as one of the Human Torch's nemeses. She used her wits and the power of asbestos to make an 100% fireproof suit made of, you guessed it, 100% asbestos. Granted, in the 1940s we didn't fully understand the long term effects of asbestos, still, using it to fight the human torch seems pretty ridiculous. Marvel later made a point of mentioning in one of their handbooks that Lady Asbestos had died early in her middle age from cancer, cause you know, asbestos. Number 2, Star Fox's sexy powers. Oh goodness. The power of pheromones don't actually do that much. I mean, maybe if you were a supervillain, but Star Fox isn't even marketed as such. He's marketed as a superhero with the power to sexually influence anyone he likes, even people he doesn't like. This one is dumb on the level of the writing standpoint, as it leads to a slippery slope that is best left uh, unexplored. Not only this, but the power of persuasion never seems to work against an enemy for him. The strange thing as well with Star Fox is he actually has a bunch of useful powers. Enhanced strength, enhanced healing, he can fly. I mean, he's a titan for goodness sake. But he seems to really only like using his sexy powers, which don't work in a fight. So why do they even exist in the comics? Number one. Doorman. Dumb in the most conventional of senses, Doorman is actually a member of the Great Lakes Avengers. If you are unfamiliar with this crew of heroes, I highly recommend looking them up as many of their members are pretty ridiculous in and of themselves and pretty adorable. In fact, Dinosaur from Kelly's part 1 of this list was also a member, as was the comical though much more useful Deadpool. Doorman's power might be one of the silliest. Using dark force energy, he can allow anyone to pass through him and also pass through solid objects, making his ability useful for becoming a doorway. That's right. One of his powers is he simply can allow you to teleport from one room to the next by passing through him. Who needs a door when you have Doorman? Starting us off in at number 10, he can clone himself. Once upon a time, Superman made a duplicate of himself. And this wasn't even initially a product of the Silver Age. This actually happened in the 90s and the 60s, which is the Silver Age. Oh, and also the 30s, which is the Golden Age. Okay, let's backtrack for a sec. In 1963, there was a story in which, due to proximity to red kryptonite, Superman was split into two versions, Superman Red and Superman Blue. Now this happened when Superman is hooked up to a brain machine, which accidentally duplicates him. This story was later adapted in 1998 in a storyline called Superman Red and Superman Blue, in which Superman had developed energy-based abilities. Now to be fair, this actually happened happened before back in the golden age in the live action adventures of Superman series, when he split himself in half in order to save himself and Lois from an old collapsed mine shaft that they were stuck in. But still, that was 1938, we can give them some leeway. The 90s though? There's uh, not really an excuse for that DC. In at number 9, the Superman diet. Oh, the Silver Age. Superman's Silver Age legacy has left us with a bunch of wonderfully dumb comic book covers and plots. 
Case in point, this issue of Action Comics number 454, in which Superman is shoveling burgers into his mouth while shouting in between bites, more burgers, keep them coming or I'll starve to death. He's also hunched over like he's taking a dump on a camping trip in the forest. It's pretty great. So what exactly is going on here? In multiple iterations of the superhero, the Man of Steel has stated that he receives all the energy he needs from the sun rather than needing food for sustenance. It's thanks to his Kryptonian physiology. But sometimes he eats to fit in, or just because he wants to. And in this case, we see him in need of more energy thanks to Toy Man siphoning off his strength. Not only did this weaken Superman, but he felt like he was starving, hence eating all of those burgers as a means of countering Toy Man's device. While this power hasn't officially been retconned, it sure has not been revisited. Side note, the cover of this issue also has a burger joint restaurant in the background that has three golden arches. In at number 8, Phasing Through Matter. <laughs> In the death of Superman, a story arc some of you know I have serious beef with, Superman and Doomsday punch each other to death and a whole ridiculous story arc is spawned from it, inevitably ruining the concept of death in comics. Mm. Let's leave it at that for now. Years later in Superman issue 175, the Man of Steel found himself coming face to face with Doomsday yet again. And what does he do? He phases through Doomsday's punches. Come on, DC. What the hell? Apparently, this is a similar ability to what the Flash has, where he moves so fast and vibrates his molecules so that he can phase through objects and individuals. The real kicker, though? Superman possessed phasing powers back in 1958 in an episode of Adventures of Superman. Guess DC just ignored that altogether. Guess they can just create powers when necessary and take them away when they want to to turn a profit. Sorry, getting a little salty over here. Let's move on to something a little bit more lighthearted. In at seven, Dinosaur. Oh boy, this one is a real gem. This is Dinosaur, T two, two words, <laughs> whose name is a pun in case you needed confirmation on that front. She first appeared in West Coast Avengers issue 46 in 1989 as a member of the team and was born in the Savage Land, we think. That's why she's a terrifying humanoid dinosaur. Here's the thing though, she doesn't speak a lick of English. So we never found out whether or not her origins were extraterrestrial or not, if she was just, you know, merely a mutant. So why does she find herself on this list? Well, despite her horrific appearance, she has the ability of empathetic calming, a power that she would often use on the team's leader, Mr. Mortal, every time he came back to life. Kind of a paradox, isn't it? Now, aside from that, she doesn't appear to age, and she can project waves of sonic force and fly around because she is basically a humanoid pterodactyl, so. Moving on to six, Tar Baby. Keeping on with the weird superheroes here, let's take a look at a mutant whose powers are equally strange as they are gross. In at number six, we have Tar Baby, a member of a community of mutants who lived beneath New York thanks to their extreme nature of their mutations. He actually lived a pretty tragic life, having survived the Mutant Massacre and returning to live in the underground tunnels after a stint with X Factor. He was eventually killed by the Weapon X program at their Neverland facility in Weapon X Volume 2, Issue 5. So what can Tar Baby do, aside from potentially having a name that could be correlated with an offensive racial depiction of black people in the past? Well, he has the ability to cover his body with a black adhesive substance that looks a whole lot like tar, hence the name. It seeps through the pores of his skin and objects will permanently stick to him on contact. As you can imagine, that doesn't help much when attempting to live life day to day. Sure, he can scale walls, but he is constantly getting junk stuck to him, hence his raggedy appearance. It's like a walking trash can. In at five, gold balls. Gold Balls is so weird, you guys. He is a hero whose body spews gold balls. Not made of actual gold, but of an unknown substance which is kind of gross. And his body can absorb said balls. Gold Balls debuted in Uncanny X-Men Volume 3, Issue 1 in 2013. He first attempted a robbery in San Diego after he discovered his powers, and the police tried to arrest him for it until Cyclops and the X-Men intervened. Gold Balls is a mutant, whose real name is Fabio Mendina, and he can project gold-colored balls of varying sizes at high speeds from any part of his body. Think about that for a sec. He can summon an infinite number of them, and if he concentrates enough, he can project them into a specific area rather than just spew them out randomly. And he generally reabsorbs them, although if he is calm and focused enough, he can make them disappear altogether. So where do they go? What are they made of? Are they part of his body? There are so many questions. But at least compared to some of the other heroes on our list, Gold Balls' balls, oh god, are at least useful. Sometimes. And at number four, Daredevil feels colors. <laughs> 
Oh, Daredevil is yet another character on our list that has a great set of powers but has received a few add-ons over the years that are questionable at best. Daredevil has sometimes been depicted as being able to sense colors by feeling an object. It was something that was featured in his very first issue where he straight up says this while sewing, I quote, I can even blend the colors, for each colored fabric has a different feel to me. As you can imagine, that little trick faded into obscurity for a while, but somehow found its way back into Murdoch's panels in Daredevil issue 60, where he disguises himself as some dude by duplicating his hair color, something he manages to pull off with some chemicals that he has been randomly carrying around in his pocket. Here he says, I quote, Maybe I can only feel color, not see it, but a few hip pocket chemicals will darken my hair color to match his. Hip pocket chemicals? Ugh, it's just weird. <laughs> Moving on to number three, Gin Genie. Jin Genie, aka Becca Parker, was one of the members of the X Force's reality TV iteration. More on them later. The superpowered mutant group was made up of a bunch of misfits, including her, with the majority of them having really absurd powers. Jin Genie is no different. As her name suggests, her abilities are tied to alcohol consumption. She can generate powerful seismic vibrations, but here's the kicker those seismic vibrations are proportionate to the amount of alcohol she consumes. If she mixes her alcohol, she can produce dangerous tremors. It also doesn't help that Becca was also. Also an abusive alcoholic who would often aim her seismic waves at her own teammates. Yeah, no bueno. Moving on to number two, Long Neck. Long Neck is definitely one of our more obscure characters on this list. He is a mutant who has a slightly longer neck than normal. Seriously, that's it. While that was helpful to Cyclops back when the befuddling character Zorn went on a rampage, Long Neck, aka William Hanover, didn't really do much of anything else. He attended Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. When M Day came around, he was depowered. But here is where it gets real tragic, or hilarious depending on your brand of humor. When all of the mutants were depowered, his neck, which extended up to 6 feet in length, snapped when he was trying to revert it back to normal, ultimately killing him. Yeah. Moving on. And finally, in number one, Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist, aka Alex Clooney, was the leader of the X Statics team when it was initially called X Force, the reality TV version. This version of the team was that celebrity superhero team who generally fought in glorified publicity stunt battles. Alex wasn't the nicest of fellows. Along with Coach, the team's manager of sorts, he had planned to have the rescue mission of a boy band at an event go sour, with an accident occurring that would kill more than half the team so they could replace the members. Zeitgeist was meant to be one of the only characters who survived the accident, but the scheme went haywire and resulted in his death with his body being split in two and his gut spewing out. Speaking of spewing though, let's talk about his powers. Now that's a segue. Everyone on this iteration of the X-Force team had questionable or comical abilities to an extent. And Axel is no different. His mutation allowed him to spew acidic vomit from his mouth. Yeah. He wore a protective mouthpiece both in and out of his costume in order to prevent himself from getting vomit on his person, which would likely kill him. It was made out of an unknown material that was plastic like in nature, but more resistant. His puke could burn through 10 centimeters of steel in less than 30 seconds, which, yeah, is impressive, but still incredibly nasty. And at number 10, manipulation of iron blood content. As much as I adore the original X Men films from the early 2000s, this power is one that gets a bit of an eye roller. In the second of the series, X2 X Men United, Sir Ian McKellen's Magneto is locked up in a nifty plastic and glass prison. Since you know, if it was metal, he would have been out of there ages ago. So, in order to orchestrate his big escape, he has Mystique inject a guard who works at the prison with liquid iron. Apparently, she injects him with enough of the stuff that when he comes to do his patrol duty over the Master of Magnetism cell, Eric is able to physically remove that liquid from his body, siphoning it out in order to use it to aid in his flight. It seems a tad silly, doesn't it? According to the comics, though, this was actually unnecessary. In Magneto Dark Seduction Issue 3, Magneto is able to manipulate the regular levels of iron in the human body. If he focuses hard enough, causing one's blood flow to reverse and immobilize his victims. He uses this little trick on the Avengers, but like a few other numbers on our list, it's a move that makes him unnecessarily overpowered. Dude is already an Omega level mutant with an awesome amount of power, after all. Manipulating people's bodies at will is just a tad extra, isn't it? And at number nine, telepathic resistance. Considering his biggest foe over the years is the powerful psychic Charles Xavier, this little power of Eric's sure does come in handy, and makes for some interesting story conflict when it's come up in the panels. The reason this lands on our list though is because of the continuity of this power over the years. Sometimes Magneto's telepathic resistance is attributed to his helmet. Other times, it's a resistance that Magneto seemingly has developed naturally. The latter can be seen in the Uncanny X-Men comics. Magneto once meditated so hard that he 
created a mental block that prevented Emma Frost, another powerful psychic mutant, from reading his mind in close proximity to him. Yet at the same time Magneto has also proven to be susceptible to some psychic attacks, or at least very powerful ones. After he ripped out the adamantium from Wolverine's skeleton, Professor X lost it and wiped Magneto's mind, putting him in a coma, which would inevitably lead to the events and creation of Onslaught. And then heroes were born. It was a fun time. Moving on to number 8, he can wield Thor's hammer. Ok so this one is kind of cheating ever so slightly since it's only a power that he has in the ultimate universe on earth 1610. And technically it might not be so much of a power as it is being worthy but it kinda seems more like a power. Regardless of how you want to view it, it's something that Eric can do on alternate earth. And it has devastating effects. Context time. In Ultimates 3 Volume 1 Issue 5 from 2008, Magneto was pretty fired up over the deaths of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, who are incestuous in this universe might I add. Mm. In a battle between Ultron and the Ultimates, that universe's version of the Avengers, Thor ends up dropping his hammer into a crevice, unable to get to it. And Magneto uses this to his advantage, manipulating the iron that is found within the hammer to use it. Which, I mean, it is made of Uru. Too, so I guess it's only trace iron. Anyway, use it he does. He creates a massive flood in New York with it, which kills thousands and separates the Ultimates team. It's eventually taken away from him when the X-Men join the fight and Cyclops defeats him. In at 7, he can be a convincing Nazi. Cap has been a Nazi more than most heroes, and definitely more than men and definitely more than any of his Avengers peers. That's kind of a skill, right? Urgh, the ability to be a convincing Nazi, yeah. Aside from Secret Empire in 2017, the whole thing was a different Steve Rogers, it's a long story, Cap has also raised his fascist flag in 1965 and in 1979. The former was in Tales of Suspense, issue 67, and the latter in Captain America, issue 234. Both times he snapped out of it though before the conclusion of the story. So not a permanent Nazi, but Nazi for a day. Gee. Still bad. Speaking of bad, in number 6, super racism. Captain America used to be quite racist back in the 40s, as in he literally used to go around shouting, I quote, white America is a strong America. Wow. Now this is very much a product of the wartime comics, where comics were largely used as propaganda even before the US entered into the fray of World War II. Cap and other heroes, including DC's Superman and Batman, found themselves saying pretty terrible things and doing pretty terrible things with other races and cultures, including the Japanese and the Chinese, who were largely targets in pop culture media at that time. So why is this on a powers list? Because characters the likes of Captain America have great influence over their readers, especially considering he is such an important patriotic symbol. What he does in his panels matter. While this is obviously no longer the case, Cap is anything but racist these days, it is still a startling panel to see. Up next number 5, the power of Preach. It is undeniable that Captain America is a gifted orator. There's a reason why he's often in a leadership position. Dude is really good at motivating and inspiring people. It's kind of his whole shtick, considering his superhero persona in the first place. Let's quickly count down some of the more inspirational speeches of his over the years. In the MCU, there's the whole Price of Freedom speech in Captain America the Winter Soldier. He gave a powerful speech when turning down the presidency in the comics in Captain America issue 250. He even finds himself filming PSAs for high schools about detention, as seen in the MCU Spider-Man film. And then there's the whole whatever it takes speech in Endgame. Hell, even the Ultimate Universe Cap can give a good speech, although a mildly rude and offensive one. He went on a tangent about how the A on his helmet didn't stand for France after he was advised to surrender. Regardless of what it is he's saying, Cap can command a room and can compel almost anyone's attention with his gift of the gab. Moving on to number 4, Super Accuracy. Once upon a time in Captain America Comics issue 3, the third issue of his solo series that began in the 40s, Steve Rogers threw a sharp dinosaur bone at a foe and impaled him murdering him. I mean it was 1941 so a lot of stuff like this slipped under the radar prior to the comics code authority. Ah the golden age of comics. Anywho the story takes place in a museum as Cap and Bucky attempt to stop two small time robbers from thieving. The dude he kills is a guy named Lenny. He's a petty henchman who probably did not deserve to die, especially in that way. Regardless, that is some damn good accuracy, impaling the kid right through the heart with that bone. It's almost impressive if it wasn't so homicidal. Speaking of using objects to kill people, in at number 3 he can get homicidal with a shield. <laughs> Steve Rogers has quite the bloody track record. Clearly. Aside from using dinosaur bones to impale lowly criminals, he's also used his shield to murder people too. So wholesome. I mean, it is kind of impressive though, isn't it? I mean, sure, it's made of vibranium, but using an object like that effectively to commit homicide is definitely a skill. 
right? Right. Anyway, Cap uses S.H.I.E.L.D. to help out superhero Union Jack when Jack's brother, Baron Blood, a vampire if the name didn't give it away, went on a rampage. Cap found himself having to permanently take care of the problem by decapitating him with his shield as Union Jack looked on, and as Baron Blood clawed at his chest too to boot. Ugh. Moving on to number two, the Battle Van. You've heard of the Batmobile, the Quinjet, the Hell Cycle. You name it. But have you heard of the Battle Van? Aside from having a bit of a lackluster name, the Battle Van is more commonly known as Captain America's Van. Which isn't much better, is it? A product of the 80s, this rad custom built van, a Chevy nonetheless, was a nondescript vehicle designed by Wakandans for Cap. I mean, I get it, it's really good when you're trying to be low key, but it kind of looks like he just stole the mystery machine from Scooby Doo and then spray painted it one color to avoid getting caught. Those dang kids. The van can actually change colors, might I add, but whatever. It can basically function as a base on the go for Cap. It has a mount for his motorcycle at the back because, you know, one vehicle wasn't enough, and even has a little cot if he feels like nap time. Oh. It is worth noting that an alternate reality version of Cap from Earth 600043 actually uses this man religiously, which is pretty great. And finally, in at number one, he cannot get drunk. Because of Cap's incredibly fast metabolism, thanks to the Super Soldier Serum, he has an immunity to a lot of things. The serum prevents the buildup of fatigue poisons in his muscles, his body is resistant to gases and hypnosis like we mentioned, and he has an immunity to alcohol, meaning he can never get drunk. Often his resistance to alcohol is played up as a joke in the comics, or his cinematic appearances, but in a way, that kind of sucks, doesn't it? I mean, not saying that you need to get drunk at a party to have fun, but having the option to choose would be nice at least. He's not the only superhero who suffers from this ailment either. Deadpool has a similar problem thanks to his boosted regenerative healing factor. And at number 10, Wither. Let's start off our list with a power that's dark as hell. Wither is a mutant who first appeared in New Mutants Volume 2, Issue 3 back in 2003, and has dabbled in both heroics and super villainy. His power is a unique one that has devastating consequences. It is the power of disintegration. This means everything that he touches decays and disintegrates. It's also involuntary, kind of like Rogue's abilities. Extended contact from Wither could reduce anything or anyone to dust. Luckily, it only affects organic matter. Wither, whose real name is Kevin, believes that his power has a hunger, a desire for him to use it. Yet this has never been confirmed and could merely be psychological. Moving on to number 9, Magneto's Magnetic Attraction. While Magneto's powers are no laughing matter, over the years he's been imbued with a few extra skill sets pertaining to his magnetism that have left a few readers rolling their eyes. Magneto is one of the best baddies ever written, a villain with a point, who can not only conduct extreme amounts of chaos like rising up a whole stadium into the air, but can also mess with the iron in your blood to knock you out, or even, if you're Wolverine, rip your skeleton out of your body. It's brutal stuff. So why on earth would someone think, hey, we should give Magneto a new trick? It's beyond us. That seems to be the case in Volume 1 of X-Men Issue 18 where he literally says this. I quote, Gaze into my eyes. Now you cannot turn away. You are held by magnetic attraction. And no, my friends, this isn't a cute play on words as far as our pal Eric is concerned. He once tried it on Blob and discovered the mutant had a mental block. As you can imagine, that ability faded into obscurity pretty darn quick. Moving on to number 8, Hindsight Lad. Carlton Lefroig is a somewhat sad individual. He would learn that his neighbor Robbie Baldwin was the superhero speedball during an accident where their building was engulfed in Darkling's Dark Force. Being a misfit himself, Carlton threatened to reveal Robbie's identity unless he let him join the new warriors. Speedball begrudged grudgingly agreed, and Carlton became known as Hindsight Lad, a dude whose costume consisted of a helmet that had two car rearview mirrors attached to its sides. Yeah, despite not having any real powers, he actually turned out to be an asset, being helpful on a management front and with his computer whiz abilities, and design strategies for the team. He would eventually leave the team though, giving up the life of a hero, becoming a self-proclaimed Marvelologist, a reclusive paranoid period of his life during Civil War. So really, no powers, just a knack for research and strategizing, and had a persona that made zero sense. Hindsight? Yeah, not really helpful in matters of life or death, is it? Definitely not something a superhero would want. Number seven, fast talker. The Flash, if he forgets, will talk at the same pace he thinks, which is incredibly fast. In fact, he can talk at a speed so fast he can only be understood by other speedsters. Now, the fast talking is a cute character trait, and it makes sense, but it also raises a very depressing conundrum, the likes of which is explored by songs such as The Ballad of Barry Allen, and that is, 
Is the Flash okay? The Flash is such a happy, well-adjusted hero, but this ability really makes you think. How slow must everybody else seem to him? How does he stand it without snapping? And how does he form meaningful connections when he could have finished a whole conversation while you're just finishing a sentence? It also feels like he would constantly have to be thinking about this. You would think he would forget this more often. Then you start to think, should he come across as more jittery? Cause even a slight movement from him would come across like a very quick jerk to somebody else. Just us regular slow folks. See, it's opened up a whole other world and it's, it's kinda sad. Number six, mimicking voices. Staying on the path of voices, the Flash can vibrate his vocal cords to the point where he can sound like absolutely anybody. Now this would be an extremely useful ability, and it's one that if you extrapolate, yeah, it makes sense I guess. However, why wouldn't he use this all the time? It would be an advantage in so many situations, confuse enemies and allies alike. And that's the thing. It's too good. This ability, like some of the others, is a huge advantage, and also a little more on the villainous side of things. Still, this is an ability I would actually like to see more of, and I'm not averse to a darker berry. It's just hilarious when Grant Gustin tries to do it. Floppy emo hair. Number five, expert folder. Okay, this is never overtly stated, but think about it. For years, The Flash has kept his costume inside a ring and then shoots it out and changes into it at super speed. This is when he needs it, but how does he get it back inside the ring? Because he does. And this usually joke, oh, he can. But you know what? No, super folder, super speed expert folder. They say that the costume is sucked back into the ring by special gas when the ring is opened. Okay, sure, Jan. Just admit it, he folds it super fast where no one can see. He just has a really impractical method of storing it. You're The Flash, you could just keep it anywhere and run and change into it and still be back in time to stop whatever crime is happening. We believe in you. Number four, speed scout duplicates. So The Flash can create duplicates of himself that he can send forward and back in time. Sometimes they're duplicates, sometimes they're versions of himself from a few seconds or minutes in the past or future. Either way, it gets weird if you think about it too hard. Communicating with yourself a minute or two from now and then telling yourself what to do, it just seems disconcerting. And how do the timeline effects ripple out? Is this how the universe ends? Barry telling his past self to remember to buy milk so he can have cereal when he gets home? Barry would totally have cereal for dinner. You know it. When you start dealing with time travel and Barry, it can get messy, especially since he doesn't need his fancy treadmill anymore. I miss the cosmic exercise equipment. It still pops up here and there, but they take it far too seriously. Number three, one punch. So the Flash can use his speed and the speed force to amplify a bunch of abilities. So he can also channel this speed and energy into one mega meta powered punch. A dangerous, potentially life ending blow that is supposedly guaranteed to end most average villains. Not kill them, just end the fight. Even if they are metas themselves. Sometimes people call this the ultimate punch. And well, it's very much maybe a one hit KO type deal or a we need the big guns kind of deal. So it doesn't happen too often, but when it does, it raises the question. So can't he just channel the energy into himself and be all around stronger kind of on average? See, sometimes a less than stellar power makes you question the character's other abilities. Also, the fact that the Flash isn't the strongest is part of what makes him interesting because he needs to find other solutions for his extremely strong foes. Number two, constructs. Now, when you hear the word constructs, your mind may go, oh, Green Lantern. But no, by using the speed force, the Flash 2 can create solid constructs and objects. Objects he can then use. How does he do this? While well, fans are still arguing about it, banding about terms like speed and light, and if we got them at the right vibrational speed, sure it could be solid. While others say, why could he be able to do that? That's too much power. Now the Flash phasing through things, legit, but then turning around and making things solid, is it supposed to be because they were intangible? and vibrating them into phase? Maybe. I mean, I guess if we don't get too deep, which is fine, nobody should be learning their science from the comic book universe. And if media can still tell the world that you only use part of the percentage of your brain, then the Flash can make things solid. That's the deal. Cause that's not true. Number one, strength force. This gem comes to us from the rebirth era of the Flash and introduces us to the concept of the strength force. So in the Flash number 53, the Flash is infused with the strength force. And then we got to experience really jacked up Hulkberry in 54. And yeah, it definitely is an experience. There's a bunch of monologuing about how different the strength force is. It's different than the speed force. It's 
heavier. He also uses it to talk about how he can't just think his way out of every situation, despite how fast he's able to think. The strength force is ludicrous, and they try to make more of it than just roids, because Barry is all, it's more than just muscles, I can control gravity, because he's so dense. Thankfully this is very short lived, and he shrinks back down to regular Barry Allen. But the strength force was definitely deserving of our number one, because it makes you question everything. Starting us off in at number 10, he is resistant to hypnosis. The super soldier serum gives Cap immunity towards specific toxins and accelerates his metabolism, but it also gives him resistance to hypnosis, which is really cool, except for the fact that the resistance to hypnosis is kind of moot in a few ways when you're incredibly vulnerable to manipulation in the first place, and that is something that Cap definitely is. Now before you Cap fans get upset over this, it's true. Cap has on numerous occasions been incredibly susceptible and responsive to manipulation. He's been manipulated into doing things for Hydra and other foes on several occasions. Hell, a version of Steve was going around shouting Hail Hydra in 2017's Secret Empire after all guys. I know it wasn't the real Steve Rogers or the 616 Steve Rogers, but come on. Look at how he was manipulated manipulated by Hydra when they covertly were running S.H.I.E.L.D. to secretly do their bidding in the MCU. Yeah. Ultimately, Rogers just wants to serve the greater good, but sometimes he can be naive about it. I mean, it's not totally a bad quality to have, to see the good in everybody and want to trust people. Yeah. And at number 9, Cap Wolf. Captain America can become a werewolf, or at least he has become a werewolf in the past. He briefly had werewolf powers in 1992 during a six part story arc titled Man and Wolf in Captain America issue 402. In the woods outside of Massachusetts, X Men member Wolverine finds a dead body, so he calls Cap in for assistance. While investigating, Steve ends up uncovering a town containing a bunch of lycanthropes. And of course, in the process, he himself is transformed into a werewolf. It's Cap Wolf, a vicious superhero with all the powers of Captain America and all the powers of a werewolf. Despite it not sticking, this wasn't the only time that a Captain America has become a werewolf. Sam Wilson would experience a similar situation years later while operating under the mantle. Oh, that's kind of fun. Moving on to number 8, his musical abilities. Ok, so this one is a little silly, and it's an almost ability, sort of. Back in 1985, we almost added Broadway musical star to the list of things that Captain America has done. Cap was meant to have his own musical with an estimated budget of 4 million dollars. The concept actually sounds a little amazing. Also this was outside of the comics guys. The story would have followed Steve Rogers suffering through a midlife crisis, lulls, then running off on a mission to rescue his girlfriend from a terrorist who kidnapped her. As you can imagine, a lot of people thought it was a terrible idea. Needless to say, nothing came from this idea aside from a poster advertising it in comic books, looking for girls aged 10 to 14 for the cast to play what was described as Cap's special friend. Yikes. Keeping on that silly train, that brings us to our next number. In at number 7, Super Imagination. Unfortunately, this is not what it sounds like. Super Imagination was the name given to an ability of Clark's that was initially called Telescopic Vision. This occurred thanks to a reprint of a story that appeared in Superman Annual Issue 2. So what exactly is Super Imagination? It's his ability to look back through time. And his use of it was even more absurd. Superman used his super imagination to send a giant ape named Titano who shot kryptonite from its eyes back to prehistoric times. Hmm. He also created special lead sunglasses for the ape so he would stop shooting kryptonite out of his eyes. That was a sentence. Moving on to number 6, Telekinesis. During John Brin's run on Superman, the Man of Steel had a new power added to his roster. Telekinesis, the ability to move things with his mind. Now, according to the creative, this enabled Superman's ability to fly. Apparently, Superman flying was a form of self telekinesis in which an invisible force field engulfed him and caused him to float. In addition to this, the telekinesis power also apparently explained his invulnerability, somehow. As if that wasn't bad enough, the concept was adopted by the 1987 film adaptation Superman 4 The Quest for Peace. A telekinetic beam shoots out of the hero's eyes, lifting people off of the ground. He then uses it to repair the Great Wall of China. To be fair, that saga of Superman film adaptations gave him a slew of really odd powers that generally faded into obscurity altogether. So, wouldn't think of much of it. Moving on to number 5, Telepathy. In a 1947 issue of Superman number 45, Clark finds himself going up against aliens called the Collectors in a story titled The Case of the Living Trophies. Now this alien race's whole shtick is collecting notable people, which apparently includes Lois Lane, so naturally Superman seeks them out and investigates all of their disappearances. He ends up getting captured by the Collectors but uses telepathy in order to force his captor to free him communicating with this alien without even uttering a word. 
Apparently this is something all Kryptonians can do according to the second appearance of this ability in the Lois and Clark television series. Speaking of this wacky comic issue though, that brings us to our next number. And at 4 he can shapeshift. If you thought busting out telepathy powers was something special, hold up because Superman outdoes himself with another power in that very same issue. After Superman breaks free of his captivity, he shapeshifts into a collector himself and it's actually really kind of scary how he does it. He impersonates them, tricks the other collectors and then rescues their human captives and uses a dimension traveling device to return home. How the hell did he shapeshift? Why hasn't he used this power before? And why did he never use it again? Well, I think we can all assume the answer to that last question since this is the only time he has ever pulled that stunt. Up next, my personal favorite on this list, in at three, super dancing. Oh. In the 1979 Superman Family issue 196, in a story titled Private Life of Clark Kent, Super Disco Fever, Clark is taken to a disco club forcefully by his fan club. It is worth noting that this fan club is a Clark Kent fan club, not a Superman fan club. The product of him being a news anchor at the Daily Planet building for the WGBS TV flagship television station. While judging a dance contest, he discovers that the bar is about to be bombed thanks to his x ray vision. So, what does he do? He decides to bust out some kick ass disco moves, which vibrates the floor enough to damage the explosive trigger mechanism. The best part is, as he's shaking his booty, which it quite literally says on panel, we get to read his thought bubbles that state, I saw enough of dancing before to pick up the basics. So, apparently, this is the first time that Clark has ever done any disco moves, and he's amazing, and the crowd's like, oh my god, and he saves the day. Oh, gotta love the private life of Clark Kent stories. <laughs> so good. <laughs> up next, number two, Mini Superman. Once upon a time, in Superman issue 125, the Man of Steel exhibited a particularly ridiculous and extremely memorable superpower that is so very characteristic of the Silver Age of comic books. In a story titled Superman's New Power, Superman encounters a strange alien ship that explodes on contact with him. His powers are altered, with all but flight and invulnerability removed. All of his other powers are replaced with an ability that lets him shoot out a miniature version of himself called the Superman proxy, out of his fingers. Thus begins a crazy plot in which Superman starts to use his mini me to do all of the hard work while he enjoys the perks of being a superhero. If this wasn't silly enough, the story takes it one step further with Superman actually becoming jealous of his Superman proxy, who was starting to get all of the press attention. <laughs> what? So what does Superman do? The only thing he can do, he lets the proxy sacrifice itself when a group of criminals try to kill Superman with a chunk of kryptonite. And with his mini me dead, all of his regular powers return. This was an actual story, published in 1958. And last but not least, in at number one, the Kryptonian healing coma. I am sorry, I had to. You know how earlier on we mentioned that whole phasing ability that managed to make the absurdity of the death of Superman arc even totally more absurd? Well, this is how the Death of Superman arc was actually resolved. DC didn't kill off the Man of Steel, rather he just looked dead. Yeah, He had fallen into something coined as a Kryptonian coma, a healing coma that only Kryptonians are capable of, which can nurture them back to health even if they're near death. Of course this outraged fans, and me, <laughs> who called DC out on their story arc that clearly was trying to capitalize on hype and turn a profit and inevitably ruin the concept of death in comic books. I promise I won't rant about it any more than that. Number 10. Playing sports with himself. So the Flash will sometimes use his abilities to entertain others. And well, sometimes that can get a little silly. So in the story The Flash of Two Worlds from 1961, The Flash ends up visiting Earth 2, and he meets the Golden Age Flash. This is after he vibrates his molecules in a way that he has never done before, hence introducing the world to the concept of the multiverse in comics, something that would change everything. That's all legit. What we're here to talk about is how at an orphan's benefit at the start of the story before he vanishes, he entertains an auditorium full of kids Kids by playing tennis with himself. Now, of course, the Flash could do this, but how entertaining for the kids would it be? Wouldn't he be moving too fast to really see? It would be like that race from the boys, just over in a blip. But you're just glad to be there, cause the Flash, hooray. Number nine, the Flash can change his appearance. So this is an ability that the Flash used in the Silver Age. So we're talking about Barry Allen, as he is the Silver Age Flash. He used to be able to reshape his molecules, cause super speed. And he would even be able to reshape and mold his face like putty, which was a very useful ability, but one that kind of takes him outside his whole speed gimmick. Fastest man alive, also able to move his face. A hero who can look like anyone to infiltrate areas is a 
a much different vibe than someone who's just super fast. Also, that type of ability tends to be more applied to villains, since it is more clandestine, and that can more easily be used for villainy. Superman was also able to do this at one point, but only on a rare occurrence. The Silver Age was like this though. The idea of extended continuity that included everything, so you would have to, you know, branch them all together, well, that was coming and still being developed. So you would have a bunch of one shot powers that happen once and never again. Number 8 Throwing Lightning. So The Flash, Barry Allen, and Wally West initially got their powers by being struck by lightning and covered in chemicals. Take that, Jay Garrick, and hard water. Lightning has always been a part of The Flash's motif though, down to his very costume. And later, as more and more of the Speed Force was revealed, Field, a lot of it would manifest in a way very similar to lightning, or just as lightning. So it was that Wally 2, Wallace West, the Wally of the New 52 and beyond, when they erased first Wally because Dan Didio hates him, he would be able to harness that energy of the speed force and push it out through his hands as lightning. Now, this was a more controversial ability because it's essentially energy powers, and again, that's a bit outside the wheelhouse of being the fastest. I mean, you're already fast and you get to throw energy to boot on top of all of that? That's a lot. For some, it was too much. Also, for some, anything Wallace did was too much. Poor Wally too. He's okay. His introduction to the DC Universe was rough. Who greenlit that? But so is a lot of the new 52. Moving on to number 7, Electromagnetic Spectrum Manipulation. That's a mouthful. If being able to concentrate hard enough to manipulate the iron in his foe's bodies wasn't enough, Magneto can also manipulate the electromagnetic field. This means he can control radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays, microwaves, and ultraviolet waves. He once used this power to divert radiation from a nuclear blast. He has also used it to induce mental effects like in Uncanny X-Men Volume 1 Issue 304. After the death of Ileana Rasputin, Magneto and his acolytes decide to crash her funeral but not to fight. Instead, Magneto uses his abilities to control their motor functions by freezing their neural conductivity. He was experiencing a bit of a power boost at the time might I add. This basically froze the X-Men in place so Magneto could have his moment to shine and give a big ol' evil speech. Overall, it's a really great issue to read if you're a Magneto fan. But this power of his kinda makes him OP, doesn't it? Now to be fair, it does require a great deal of energy and takes a massive toll on him physically whenever he exerts this power, but it's still a hell of a lot of power. Moving on to number 6, Electromagnetic Sight. Because of his ability to manipulate energy on the electromagnetic spectrum, Magneto also has something called electromagnetic sight. Essentially, he can visually perceive the world beyond normal sight, beyond the spectrum of visible light. He can see the electromagnetic aura that all living beings give off. This is where the whole Magneto protocols thing comes from. Because he's seen as a threat, a network of satellites was placed low in Earth's orbit, used as a cautionary tool in order to skew the Earth's electromagnetic field and prevent the Master of Magnetism from using his powers on the planet itself. I mean, that just pissed him off more, so he unleashed a planet-wide EMP that disabled basically every electronic device on the planet within a very short period of time. I mean, one hell of an F you, that's for sure. Moving on to number 5, Invisibility. Sort of. The control over the electromagnetic spectrum gives Magneto the ability to become invisible. While it's kind of scientifically questionable in the real world because of Magneto's control over electromagnetic pulses and that the extent of his powers reach all the way down to photons, he can basically turn invisible by warping visible light around his body. This is something he does in Vision and the Scarlet Witch issue 4 from 1983 and you guessed it, never really exhibited this ability much after that. Wonder why. So in other words, he's able to make it look like he's invisible. It's more of an eye trick than anything else. But you can definitely imagine how that would come in handy. And at number four, astral projection. Okay, so I feel like everyone and their grandma in the Marvel Universe can astral project. Hulk can astral project. Every single mutant with some amount of psychic ability can astral project. And of course, Magneto can astral project. This has been chopped up to his grand mental power and will and electromagnetic abilities, of course. In X-Men Volume 1, Issue 6, Magneto and his rival Charles Xavier come across Namor and are trying to figure out whether the Submariner is a mutant or not. Magneto wants to recruit him to the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. The comic literally begins with both men separately contemplating whether or not Namor is a mutant, which is kind of hilarious. Anyway, Magneto gives the recruitment efforts a go by astral projecting to travel under the ocean. Convenient. Xavier also astral projects and of course runs into Magneto's astral projection and shenanigans occur. Kinda sounds like the setup to a sitcom episode, doesn't it? Anyway, all that comes of it is Namor is like, I'm impressed by your lair, Magneto, but then is like, yikes, you're an Magneto, and after a kerfuffle, he retreats back to the ocean. Magneto's astral projection powers kind of disappeared after that, but little returned in X Men The Hidden Years after Magneto found himself in a bit of a pickle. So he astral projected in a scheme to trick people into thinking that he was dead and the projection was actually his ghost, using this as a means of having others attack the X Men for him. 
smart fella. And at number three, he can create wormholes. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like something more aligned to a cosmic hero, doesn't it? But in fact, it is something that Magneto can do. Wormhole creation. So this is another product of Magneto's ability to mess with electromagnetic fields. During the Avengers Disassembled storyline and in the Excalibur comics, we've seen Eric pull off this trick when he needed to travel between Genosha and New York. The former situation being when he needed to grab Scarlet Witch real quick when her life was threatened. Convenient way of having a character travel around, isn't it? Plot devicey, no? Some have argued that perhaps this occurred in Avengers Disassembled thanks to Wanda's powers. But Girl was pretty out of it when he picked her up and brought her through that wormhole. It also closed when he got back, so it's implied that this was something of his doing, not hers, although it could better fit under her roster of skills. Regardless, because of this little ability he's exhibited, we've had to put our next number on this list. In at number two, Travel to alternate universes. What? Okay, so there's a big old theory kicking around the interwebs about how the X-Men will be integrated into the MCU. And it's all based off of Magneto's ability to create wormholes and use them for travel. The theory suggests that Magneto's wormhole creation abilities should allow him to travel between dimensions or alternate realities. And this is how the mutants that Marvel Studios wants to carry over from the Fox franchises will find themselves in the MCU. Personally, we think that is kind of a bit of a long shot. Plus, think of the repercussions if Magneto and the comics was able to travel between alternate realities, that could stir up a whole lot of trouble for our heroes. Or at least it could have in the past prior to their Dawn of X Allegiance. Now if you guys are out of the loop on the recent X-Men comics, we definitely suggest you, you catch up. Or just check out one of our videos on the rebooted series, they're fun. But hey, maybe now is the time that Magneto could really bust out this power and f up the Marvel Universe in the comics. Who knows. And finally in at number one, my personal favorite, a magnetic personality. This is by far the dumbest power Magneto has ever had, and arguably the only power on this list that like definitely fits into the definition of dumb. We've talked about it before on our channel and a few other lists, so in case you're not privy to it, here's the lowdown. Once upon a time, Magneto was given the power of a magnetic personality. You can't make that kind of shit up, friends. In volume one, issue 18 of X-Men, Magneto shows off a new power, courtesy of Stan Lee, might I add, in which he announces, I quote, gaze into my eyes, now you cannot turn away, you are held by magnetic attraction. Now if you're scratching your head in confusion at that, that is a perfectly sound reaction to have. Essentially this was an early days power of his that popped up just the once that allowed Magneto control over people's minds in an almost hypnotic sense. And it never came up again. To be fair, he wasn't really great at using it. In this first instance, he tries to probe the mind of the blob, but fails to do so, claiming that there's a mental block in the way. Right, sure. Maybe you just like the way the magnetic attraction sounded. Hmm.